Today we're joined by Tegan Goldsmith. Tegan is the archi archivist at the Ottawa Jewish Archives, as well as the director of the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society. Tegan has worked in the archives since 2019 and is responsible for collecting and preserving Ottawa's Jewish history. We'd like to welcome Tegan and thank her for preparing this exciting presentation for us. And now I will turn off my camera and hand things over. Excellent. Thanks, Emma. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. Actually, I'm just going to turn off my camera. Can I do that? Oh, I can. Excellent. I apologize. I have a spotty Wi-Fi today, so I'm just going to keep it off for the time being. Besides, all the fun is on the slides. Okay. Okay. Um, can somebody just give confirmation they're able to see the slides okay? I can see it. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so good evening, everyone. As Emma said, my name is Tegan Goldsmith. I am the archivist at the Ottawa Jewish Archives. I'm also the executive director at the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society. Um, today, I will be telling you a little bit about the history of Ottawa's Jewish cemeteries, and in particular, of course, the Osgood Cemetery, since this is the Osgood, Osgood Museum. Um, Ottawa's Jewish cemetery history is about 130 years old, and I think it's one of those subjects that people don't think about very often and something people really don't like to talk about. Um, let's be honest, cemeteries are not um, the happiest memories for a lot of people. Sometimes it's the saddest days of our lives, and um, I'm somebody that really, really loves cemeteries. I think they're incredibly interesting, um, so I hope that I can at least pique your interest tonight and maybe change your mind a little. So before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge that the land the Ottawa Jewish Archives is built on, like the Osgood Museum, and the land that I'm currently speaking to you from is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We know that by acknowledging the land, it will not remove or atone for the atrocities that have taken place throughout our history, yet it is our intention to honor the first peoples of this land as we move with humility in the direction of reconciliation, healing, and justice. Okay, so before we jump into the history of Ottawa's Jewish cemeteries, I wanted to give a quick overview of the archives for anybody who may not be familiar with us. So the Ottawa Jewish Archives is located in the Soloway Jewish Community Center in Ottawa. We are just off of Carling Avenue and we are a part of the Greater Jewish Community Campus, which houses schools, a daycare, a retirement home, and the Jewish Community Center where the archives is located. Um, we were established in 1969, and our mandate is to, quote, strive to maintain the collective memory of the Jewish community of Ottawa through its objectives to acquire, preserve, and make accessible its holdings, which document the history, uh, growth, and development of the Jewish community within Ottawa and the National Capital Region. This is basically just a really winded way of saying that we collect items that pertain to Jewish Ottawa specifically. Our collection tells the story of community life in Ottawa starting in the 1890s all the way up until the present day. So we were established in 69 by our founder and very first archivist, Mrs. Shirley Berman. Uh, Shirley was originally from the Toronto area, much like myself, and she moved up here with her husband Shire in the 1960s. Shirley quickly realized that not enough of Ottawa's Jewish history was being preserved and she decided to do something about it. She and the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society uh, began collecting documents, photographs, artifacts, pretty much anything that they could get their hands on to really ensure that Jewish history was being preserved in the capital. Um, the archive's first home was in the Chapel Street JCC, where we remained for almost 30 years. If you look on the screen there, you'll see a picture of the grand opening of the community center in 51. Um, during this time, we actually amalgamated with the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society, really working as one organization intent on preserving history. In 2001, the Jewish Federation of Ottawa took ownership of the archives, and we have been with them ever since. Although the archives and the Historical Society are now separate organizations, they work very closely together, um, especially with me <laughs> working Jamie, in both I organizations, we work especially Rubega close Ranch. together. We are um, an and, a half and it is a really, really wonderful working relationship. We receive a great problems. deal of support from the Ottawa Jewish Historical a Society, and it's farm. a wonderful um, working and relationship. I the farm, but so it was in the late 1990s, the community really began to outgrow this first JCC on Chapel Street, and it was decided that a new one would be built just off of Broadview Avenue, which is where we are today. To when the JCC opened in 1998, it came with a special purpose-built room specifically for the archives, and we were given an office, so yeah, uh, a research and processing room, and of course, the big vault, where all of our history is stored. 
So after my biggest 25 fear years, getting this into market gardening was definitely home. finances to see if this was financially viable. Okay, on to the cemeteries. So in its um, history, Ottawa has had three different Jewish cemeteries, really with the Osgood Cemetery being the most continue, recent of those three. Continue farming so the first cemetery, while it was short-lived, the was the Bozeville Cemetery, which was, of course, located One on way Bozeville that Road. We came at this um, the earliest we records we have on it date back to 1886, when the Society of the Sons of Jacob purchased a plot of land from Moses Bilski, who I have a photo of, of on the screen. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with Moses Bilski, he is one of Ottawa's earliest Jewish settlers, and his family was extremely involved in community life. Um, not a lot is really known about this property since very few records still exist, but from what we do know, um, from 1886 until, or, yeah, 1886 to 1893, this plot of land was the only Jewish cemetery in the city. So prior to 1886, burials actually had to happen up in Montreal, where the nearest Jewish cemetery was. What this means is that uh, if you had somebody who passed, you had to be transported the 200 kilometer journey all the way up to Montreal in order to be buried. As you can imagine, that was a less than ideal situation. Keep in mind as well that in the 1890s, um, 1880s, 1890s, Ottawa's Jewish community was quite small. This probably didn't happen very often. Um, but still not the greatest situation. Now, in 1893, Ottawa's first congregation, Addis Jeshurun, purchased land on the Metcalf Highway, which today is modern-day Bank Street, um, and they purchased it with the intention of setting up another cemetery, this time one that was congregation-run as opposed to society-run. Now, I will get to the Bank Street Cemetery next, but I did want to mention that in March of 1897, for reasons unknown, Addis Jeshurun took over ownership of the Bowesville Cemetery from the Society of the Sons of Jacob. Um, as far as I understand, the property was given to the congregation for around the price of a dollar. Um, we're not really sure why this transaction happened. Uh, you will notice this is a big theme with the Bowesville Cemetery. <laughs> this land transfer came after a lawsuit agreement between the Society and Moses Bilski. So while we don't necessarily know the nature of the lawsuit, we do have a copy of the agreement, which I have on the screen. It's just not unfolded there. Um, and the agreement indicates that the, that it was between Moses Bilski and Moses Goldstein, Samuel Kopelman, Jacob Freeman, uh, Mr. I. Rubenstein, and the Society of the Sons of Jacob. The son and stated that Moses Bilski was to return the Ten Commandments that belonged to the society, and the society was to pay Moses Bilski ten or fifty dollars, and members of the Bilski family were given the right to be buried in this cemetery at the same rate as members of the society. So two days after this agreement, the mortgage on the cemetery was discharged and handed over to Addis Jeshurun Congregation. Um, this piece of land stayed in the possession of the congregation unchanged until 19. 58, when the land was sold to the Crown for $1,300. Um, while we're not really certain why the sale occurred, it is believed that this may have been from pressure from the National Capital Region to sell so that they could put in major roadways um, to help develop our city. The sale made for kind of a difficult situation as those who were buried in the cemetery, including the Bilski family, needed to be exhumed and reburied in the Bank Street Cemetery so that this portion of land could be developed. Um, again, I don't have any records on the exhumation, but uh, we're uncertain when the transfer happened, but I have been assured that they were moved to Bank Street at some point. <laughs> now on to the Bank Street Cemetery. So the Bank Street Cemetery is currently the oldest still operating Jewish cemetery in the city. On June 8th, 1893, um, at a congregation at a Jeshurun purchased the land on the Metcalf Highway from the Spratt family. So at this time, Adit Jeshurun was a young congregation and their major concerns were really identifying and establishing the needs of their community. This included creating burial ground for Ottawa and the surrounding areas, Jewish communities. Um, John Dover, who I have a photo of on the screen, was one of the congregation's earliest leaders and he was tasked with finding suitable land for the cemetery to be built. He ended up choosing an acre of farmland just off of the Metcalf Highway. So according to local lore, Dover approached Mr. James Spratt, who was an esteemed landowner and descendant of early Ottawa settlers, and he asked to purchase the land from him. 
Dover humbly stated that he came from a, quote, poor and small congregation, unquote, and Spratt agreed to the sale since the area was so far out of city limits. Um, the congregation paid Mr. Spratt $100, uh, $100, pardon me, and the Bank Street Cemetery was officially established. So one of the first people to be buried in the Bank Street Cemetery, really proving the need for a Jewish cemetery, was a young Jewish laborer who had been working downtown. It was either in the lumber mills or on a work site. Um, there are conflicting sources on that. Um, but the gist of it was that he was killed on the job and in a very rare act of kindness, his boss actually paid for him to be buried on the same day, which was really wonderful, keeping with the tradition of quick turnaround times for burials within the Jewish religion. Um, however, he didn't understand all of the requirements and ended up burying him in a Catholic cemetery, which really wasn't okay. Um, so upon hearing this, the community had his body disinterred and reburied in the Bank Street Cemetery. On to the good stuff, finally on to Osgood Cemetery. So for almost 80 years, the Bank Street Cemetery remained the only Jewish cemetery in the city. Um, by the 1970s, this was becoming a bit of a problem. So Ottawa's population absolutely exploded in the early 1900s. And by the 1940s, the Jewish population had grown to be in the thousands. When the Bank Street Cemetery was established in 1893, Ottawa only had one congregation. As the community continued to grow, more congregations were established and additional land was purchased in the surrounding areas for burials. Now, I'm just going to go back. Um, if you look at the map here, you'll see the sectioning out 1 to 11. Each section in the Bank Street Cemetery was allotted to a specific um, congregation. So that was how it was divvied up there. Um, so like I said, as this community continued to grow, sections were added for each congregation. Additional land was purchased in the surrounding areas. Um, in 1907, a Thahim congregation uh, purchased land, followed by, by Mahazik Yadas in 1907, uh, B'nai Jacob in 1928, and a Israel in 1941. So by 1950, the combined space of the cemetery and all of its synagogue sections created about 14 acres of land. Um, by 1973, Agudith Israel had run out of space for burials. Beth Shalom, which was the amalgamation of Ottawa's two oldest synagogues and the owner, owner of about 35% of cemetery land, had approximately 6,000 empty plots, but refused to sell any of them to any of the other synagogues. Um, as a result, a discussion began about building a second cemetery in the city. This, spar this idea sparked a lot of interest with the other synagogues. Um, especially for those who were, number one, running out of space, and for new congregations like Temple Israel, which had just been newly formed, they had absolutely no burial space at all. Um, a proposal was made, and Temple Israel, Agudath Israel, Young Israel, and Mahazik Yadas all stepped up to express interest in establishing a new cemetery. Um, Beth Shalom, despite already having a large amount of land available for burials, also decided to join in on the new cemetery. So in the same year, 1973, a search committee was put together with Mr. Israel Schinder appointed as the chair of this committee. Um, according to Mr. Schinder, more than a dozen locations were considered before the Osgood location was chosen. In fact, it took almost eight months of searching before they found the Osgood location and another five months of negotiations after that. This location was, this, um, Pardon me. This location was chosen for a few reasons. Um, I know that many suspect it was the lower price for more land, which of course helped to seal the deal. Uh, but there was also a number of other reasons that led to Osgood really becoming the home for the second cemetery. So developing a cemetery comes with a number of preconditions, um, but there are two major aspects that contribute to the development of cemetery grounds and Osgood really had both of these. So the first is finding the right land. This means making sure that it is suitable land for burials where there is no heavy clay or rocky soil. Um, you can imagine if you're trying to dig a grave six feet under and you're coming across rocks and heavy clay, it's going to be very, very difficult. It's not going to be um, a very good experience. So you want to make sure that that land is easy to dig through. Um, another aspect is in terms of the Jewish community, it must be a reasonable distance from the city, especially for those who are attending a Friday afternoon funeral, which is Shabbat. Um, this is a really big consideration because Jews who are observant of Shabbat cannot use a car or transit once the sun sets. 
So if there is a funeral that's occurring on a Friday afternoon, there needs to be enough time for someone who is attending a funeral to get home before the sun sets. Um, on a day with no traffic, the Osgood Cemetery is about 30 minutes from the JCC, which is an appropriate distance for a Friday service. Um, back in the 1970s, I can only imagine how much quicker it was without, that, without all the traffic we have now. So the second precondition that comes is meeting provincial and local standards. So once the location is selected, the process of meeting standards has to begin. Both the provincial and local health departments have to approve the space and drainage situation, and the land has to be rezoned for cemetery purposes. Um, this can be a little bit of a, a difficult process, considering that cemetery land is tax-free, and it is the municipality that has to approve the zoning. Some municipalities can be a little less than accommodating, considering this is tax-free land that brings in no income for the region. Um, and finally, it must be approved that your group is in need of new cemetery in order to receive a license to bury, and then it must be agreed that all rules pertaining to the burial and cemetery maintenance will be met. Um, thankfully, all of those requirements were met and rezoning was approved by the Osgood Township without any trouble, making Osgood really the perfect spot for the new cemetery. <clears throat> Once it was decided that Osgood would be the location, a draft of the budget was pulled together with the land costing about $60,000 and development another $100,000. Development began and the sections for each synagogue were created in a very similar fashion to what was done at Bank Street. Um, as you saw with the Bank Street one, that one was all linear, side by side by side. This one is more circular, so it's a little bit more of like pie slices, if you will. Um, each synagogue or each section, pardon me, would reserve its own halakhic rights, which are Jewish laws for burials, um, which is determined by the individual synagogue that that section belongs to. So from 1973 to 1976, the search committee worked on finding the right land. They dealt with meeting regulations and standards, and they visited other Jewish cemeteries in Ontario and Quebec for inspiration. Um, I'll just go back a slide. These photos here are just an example of a 1975 trip they took to Montreal, looking at what a Jewish cemetery looked like there and just kind of coming up with plans and, and um, really scoping out things that they could do. Back. So after three years of work, the cemetery was finally ready to be opened and the cemetery opened its gates to the public on October 31st 1976 at 6549 Herbert's Corners Road, which is where, of course, it still is today. Um, this was a really big day for the community. Many showed up for the grand ceremony, and Saul Schinder, who was then president of the VOD, which today is known as the Jewish Federation of Ottawa, officially opened up the cemetery. So the cemetery doesn't uh, didn't just show off the new the new acreage and all the future burial plots. There was also a traditional burying of Sefer Torahs, prayer books, and other religious articles. You can see the large um, the large holes that have been dug on in the photos on the screen. This was in, in preparation for um, this ceremony. So for those who may not know, religious texts like Torahs, prayer books, and anything else that has the name of God written in it cannot be thrown away. Um, instead, they are buried. That is what this ceremony involved. So today the Osgood Cemetery is home to one of the community's Genitza, um, which is a small structure used for storage of such items before they are buried. Once a year, the cemetery will do a ceremonial burying of all of these texts. Um, this is actually a service that the library and I utilize occasionally when people donate religious items to us. Um, there are some things that we just can't take. Of course, we cannot throw them out. So these items are sent to the Genitza in anticipation of the burial every year. So this event in 76 was attended by rabbis, religious leaders, community members, members of large organizations like the VOD and many, many more. Um, these new grounds gave space for congregations who didn't have space for burials and allowed for future congregations to join as well. So while the new cemetery operated under equal percentage costs, the Bank Street Cemetery still operated under its 1949 land percentage agreement, which basically worked out to you pay the percentage of the cost based on the percentage of the land your congregation owned. So in 1976, Beth Shalom, now the amalgamation of not just the first two congregations in the city, but also B'nai Jacob, uh, was now paying 75% of the cost of maintenance at the Bank Street Cemetery, in addition to the 20% they agreed to pay at the new Osgood Cemetery. They felt that this was an unfair um, 
they, they felt it was unfair and they appealed to the cemetery committee to strike a deal with a good Israel. So since Beshalom didn't require the plots in the new cemetery for many years, it was agreed that a good Israel would cover some of the maintenance costs in Bank Street to try and offset. Um, a good Israel would now cover the 25% of maintenance and Beshalom would cover 60. This agreement remained in place until 1994 when Beshalom once again brought up issues with the land percentage agreement, stating that it was unfair and they stopped contributing to maintenance costs altogether. For the next 14 years, each synagogue would manage its own maintenance costs, and Israel Schinder, who was chairman of the cemeteries, spent many years trying to work out disputes and resolve issues amongst the respective areas. In 2008, maintenance and operations costs, as you can imagine, had really come to a head. Spats continued to arise over the different types of maintenance, and after many years of this system going on, it was decided that the decades-old system was no longer working, and uh, they decided to bring operations for the cemetery all under one umbrella organization. And this is how we had the idea of the Jewish Memorial Gardens came into being. Um, on July 1st, 2008, after 115 years of the cemeteries being synagogue run, the Jewish Memorial Gardens took ownership and began handling all aspects of operations. With the new corporation overseeing everything, synagogues were able to retain their halakha control over their respective sections, with the Jewish Memorial Gardens handling pretty much everything else. So today, Ottawa still has these two Jewish cemeteries, um, and they serve the Jewish community quite well. In the last 130 years, there have been around uh, 5,500 to 6,000 burials, averaging about 75 per year. The Jewish Memorial Gardens consists of one staff member who is executive director, Tammy Toronto, who is wonderful, and an extremely dedicated volunteer board. Um, when someone in the community passes, it is a community effort. Tammy collaborates with the synagogues, the rabbi, um, the Hever Kedisha, the funeral home to really make the experience as easy as possible for the family. Um, the Hever Kedisha, for anyone who hasn't heard that term before, is a volunteer run organization. They prepare the body for burial um, and really do a lot of undertaker uh, tasks, if you will. Um, Ottawa is actually one of the few cities in North America who don't need a professional undertaker um, for the Jewish community simply because they do such a wonderful job with what they do. Um, there are a number of initiatives that have been done in the last 20 years that really make a big difference in the cemetery's operations. The first is the digitization of gravestones. Now, this is something that John Diener and Heine Reichstein really worked really hard on in the early 2000s. Um, this project began in 2003, and the purpose was to digitize and create a database for the graves um, of both cemeteries, both Bank Street and Osgood. So the intention was to create a resource that people who were performing family research um, would, would help to really provide them with a concise list of all of the graves. Um, in 2003, the Jewish Memorial Gardens hadn't actually been created yet, which meant that anybody who was looking for information on a particular grave or somebody who had passed would have to approach the relevant synagogue in order to get access to that information. Um, by 2004, all of the graves have been recorded and a concise list was created. This list is now available online through the Jewish Memorial Gardens website, and it is a really, really invaluable um, resource for researchers and especially for me at the archives. I know I access it almost on a daily basis. I know my assistants all access it on a daily basis. Um, it is a really, really wonderful feature and it's so nice to have and it's, it's wonderful for people who are trying to do family research. It makes everything so much easier. Um, so the site features the location of where the grave is, it shows a map for directing visitors to it, and it's got a, for the most part, pretty much all of them, um, have a photo of the monument as well as the death date. The website also notes whether the grave is for an allied, vet or, pardon me, allied forces veteran, whether they're a Holocaust survivor or an IDF veteran as well. Um, every year, the Jewish Memorial Gardens honors the memories of survivors and veterans by making the appropriate grave, marking, pardon me, the appropriate graves with Canadian flags for Remembrance Day, which you can see in the photo here, um, and with Israeli flags for Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron. So um, this photo was actually taken this year by John Diener. They had a wonderful day where some of the kids from the Jewish, uh, I think it was one of the Jewish day schools, 
um, came to the cemetery. Each kid was broken into a group. They gave out some flags. They were given a list and they had to go all over the cemetery and mark all of the veterans and honor them that way. So really, really wonderful um, that they do this. So every fall, the online database is updated with all the new graves from the last year. So for the most part, it is as up to date as it could be. In addition to the Graves database, in 2004, the Ottawa Jewish Historical Society began recording eulogies at funerals and donating these copies to the Ottawa Jewish Archives. Um, and then a copy is also sent to the family of the deceased. So the first eulogy that was ever recorded was on July 27th, 2004, and it was the funeral of Mr. Hai Soloway, which is a really incredible one to be the first because the JCC that we are located in is the Soloway JCC. Um, he's a very important man in the community. Uh, to date, the archives has close to 500 of these eulogies, either in CD or in digital format. The recordings are always available to the public and they can be accessed by contacting me at the archives. Another wonderful service the Memorial Gardens does um, is it gives gravestones to those who have unmarked graves. So five or six years ago, the gardens started to notice that a number of unmarked graves in the cemetery they decided to do something about it. Um, a policy was then initiated that anyone who passed away, a monument deposit had to be collected from the family. And if a headstone wasn't installed after two years of the passing, the Memorial, the memorial Gardens would use that deposit to place a small engraved stone um, at the grave. So the goal is that every single grave and person is marked and memorialized. Now, there are a million other things I could go on and on about. There were the renovations, there was the revitalization, there's all kinds of wonderful things, but I do believe that is my time. <laughs> so I will just end it off by saying thank you so much. Um, I hope you all really enjoyed listening. Um, I hope you've learned something new about the Jewish community, and I'm really happy to take any questions at this time. I'll stop sharing and you can see me. All right. Thank you for that. That was so awesome. Super informative. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to listen to some of those eulogies, which are really interesting always. And I have used that database before, so it is very handy. Um, I believe the chat should be open. If anybody has any questions, they can ask them here. Yes, and I know there are a couple of people who work with the cemetery on the call as well. If you have anything to add, feel mm -hmm. free. Um, there are always gaps in my knowledge. <laughs> okay, now the chat is open. I realized that it might not have actually been open before. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um. I know I had sort of like a general archives question, if you sure. answer that. So you mentioned that sometimes there's materials that you can't take. So you mentioned the religious texts and how you take them, but you can actually keep them in the archives. So what are some examples of items that you can keep, some examples of items that you don't take into the archives? Like what are the um, sort of restrictions? Good question. So... The biggest one that we don't take is anything published. Um, so like, you know, published books, like the ones behind me, that sort of thing, we wouldn't take, not unless um, it is a special exception. Um, in terms of, well, I'll mention the ones that I can't take in terms of the cemetery. Um, we get a lot of, there's little books that are handed out at bar mitzvahs um, that will have prayers in them. Um, I would love to keep them if I could, but my goodness, there have been so many bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs in this community. If I took every single one, we wouldn't have room for anything else. So I have a few samplings of those kinds of little prayer books or, um, uh, you know, wedding prayers or any bar and bat mitzvahs. So I have a few of those. I try not to take too many of them, again, because we don't have a lot of room. That's the sort of thing I would end up taking to the Genitza. Um we take diaries, we take letters. I'm very big on taking photographs. Um, gosh, there's so many things. Uh, we don't take newspapers. I love nipping that one in the bud when I can. We do not take newspapers um, because of the paper they're printed on and the fact that we already have most of them digitized. We have the Ottawa Jewish Bulletin in our community. I have every single copy of that bulletin as well as it digitized and available online. So we don't take that sort of thing. Um, pretty much anything that can help to tell the story of Jewish Ottawa's history. 
I'm pretty open to looking at. Cool, thank you. So there's two questions in the chat. The first one uh, is, were there any people who had to be moved from the Bozeville Cemetery? And then also apparently Bozeville was misspelled on the slide. Ah, thank you for catching that. <laughs> Whoever did that, I appreciate it. Um, yes, as far as I know, there were some people that had to be moved from the Bozeville. I think that's the, the records that I don't have um, access to. Like the Bilski family at some point had to be moved. I don't know who in the Bilski family. Again, Bozeville Cemetery, there are very few records. I really only have that um, that agreement between the society and Moses Bilski. Everything else is what I've read in books, what I've heard from people's recounting of things. Um, it's, re it's, it's a little sketchy. I don't have a lot to run off of. So as far as I know, they were moved to the Bank Street Cemetery. Cool. And then another one is, are there restrictions about what kinds of headstones or designs that can be installed in these cemeteries? Oh, that's a great question. I don't think I can answer that one. Um, that would be one to pass off to the cemetery um, if we can. Um, John Diener, are you on the call? I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. Can you answer that question? You probably can better than I can. Okay. Um, well, our bylaws determine, you know, size restrictions, how large they can be. Um, and generally, we have different uh, materials that are used, different types of stone for the cemetery. Some are marble, some are more of a, a matte finish. Um, as far as design, some people put on something that's, um, you know, there's some musicians buried in the cemetery. So there may be a picture of a piano on, on a gravestone. There are some symbols that are particular to the Jewish religion. Uh, if, you are a Koh if you're from a family that's descended from Kohanim, which are the priests, uh, those symbols, there's a symbol for them on the, on the gravestone and similar other groups. Um, generally, anything that's tasteful uh, can be put on you know, the, the gravestone. Um, we do, our executive director, who you mentioned before, gets to see the designs before they're approved. And if there's any, anything there that could be controversial, it's brought to the board for discussion. But for the most part, you know, it's anything goes as long as it's tasteful. And, uh, and of course, there are um, traditional things that go on a, on a gravestone, such as, um, well, it's especially in the more orthodox sections, generally it lists uh, the name in Hebrew and in English. Uh, in, and for genealogi genealogical purposes, there's something uh, very nice about Jewish gravestones is that for the most part, they list not only the person's name, but the name of the father of that person. So it's, if you're doing genealogy, it's easy to trace back another generation. Hugely helpful. I will say too, one of my favorite um, had gravestones in the Bank Street Cemetery is uh, carved like a tree. It's really, really beautiful. You can see kind of the wood grain on it. That's a really mm -hmm. nice one too. Yeah. In the older sections, there's some really unique and interesting ones. The more modern ones tend to be pretty uniform. You know, there are a few different types, but for the most part, they're they're quite the same as what you'd see in any cemetery. Fine. Thank you. Um, there's another one. It's, do the two cemeteries have enough room to sustain burials for the foreseeable future? Has there been a need to establish a new one? I Again, that's probably a John question. I don't think there's any need to establish anymore. Um, there's definitely a lot of space at Osgood, and I, there's definitely some space at Bank Street yet. Hey, John? Lots of space. In fact, um, Osgood, I think we're only using about 25% of the land that's owned out there. Bank Street, uh, Tegan touched on this during her presentation. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, we did a major revitalization of the cemetery. Uh, with money that was donated from the community. And part of that was sort of reclaiming land that was swamp-like and overgrown with trees. And there's room for several thousand more burials now. So, you know, considering the fact that we're burying 75 to 80 people a year, we have enough room for quite a long time. Thank you. Um, are there any gravestones that remain in the Bank Street Cemetery from those who were moved from the Bowesville Cemetery? Oh, these are all going to be John questions. <laughs> John, do you happen to know? Yeah, I think there are some there. Uh, yeah. We also have some people that got moved from Bozeville whose graves were not marked. We know they were moved, but we're not sure exactly where they are. So someday yeah. we'll probably dig into the ground and find <laughs> remains of someone who was buried, you know, 100 and what, well, whatever. 
yeah. late 1950s, I guess. Yeah, the uh, the old section, which on the map that I had there would be section one, has uh, all the oldest graves there. Um, it's really, really cool to walk through that section because, again, the graves are so different. Um, the tombstones are very, very different to look at. They've got all the information on them. Um, one of the funniest parts for me is if you look at an overhead of that section in section two, um, you'll notice that one of the sections ends up starting to slope upwards. Not really sure what happened there. Um, if anybody wants to, I do encourage you to do an overhead view on Google Maps. Um, it looks pretty funny <laughs> to see the sloping up. Uh, but again, that's in the old section out there. And I'm again, I'm sure there's old graves from uh, from the Bowesville. Um, it says in the chat, uh, hi, me says he knows more about the Bowesville. Oh, um, I think I had another question that was a little bit more specific to the Bank Street, I believe, but I've driven past the Bank Street Cemetery a few times and I've seen there's like the, the new gate and then there's like sort of an old arch in the back mm -hmm. towards the, do you know anything about that that you'd want to share? Yeah, so that arch was um, built and funded by Ottawa's first congregation, Addis Jeshurun. Um, I believe it was intended to be used as like the entrance arch when you got there. Um, today it's pushed a little further back. It's obviously much farther from the entrance there, um, but it has some engravings on it and it has Addis Jeshurun mentioned on it um, as well as the date that I believe they put it in. But it's really, really pretty. It's, it frames everything quite nicely and there's a nice little sitting area around it as well. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Just looking at the chat. I'm trying to see if there's a way. Hi, me, if you're interested, I think I can unmute you if you'd like to talk about Bowesville. I'm not sure completely <laughs> if I'll be able to do it. Here we go. Put on my video as well. I'll put it on. Oh, you're not allowing me to put on my video. The video. But anyway. Uh, there were 11 people moved from Bowesville to Bank Street. Um, I checked with the Hever Kadisha records, and um, I know all the names that were um, removed from Bowesville to, and try to be buried at Bank Street, but we only know where five or six of them are. So there's five more, five or six people who are buried in Bank Street, where we have no idea of where they are buried. Gotcha. Um, I might have you come in sometime next week so I can get that list of names. <laughs> I have to look it up again. It's it, but it, it's in your archive. Oh, perfect. <laughs> then I will have you come in. We'll look for it together. Perfect. OK, well, if there's no more questions, thank you for that, Jaime, and thank you also um, to John for jumping in. <laughs> yes, if there's no more questions, um, I believe Tegan has put her information on the slides and she's also, you can look up the Ottawa Jewish archives online. Um, oh, sorry. There's one more. I may have missed it in the presentation, but why were people moved? Uh, from Bowesville, they were moved because the land was sold to the crown. Um, they believe it was basically so they could develop the area. Um, so they were moved to the other cemetery because they were probably going to put a roadway in. And then also, do we know the address of Bowesville? I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure I have it in the archive somewhere. So if anyone's interested, feel free to send me an email. Give me a call. I can figure that out for you. Perfect. Well, actually, the Bowesville Cemetery was somewhere around where the Billings Bridge Shopping Center and the RA Center are today. Somewhere wow. in the and when they built the extension of Bronson, you know, past Carleton, uh, when they built that road in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, they had to expropriate the land from, from the cemetery. Gotcha. Uh, which is Thank why you, John. Got moved. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so like Tegan said, if you're more than welcome to email her with any questions you may have, uh, and we just want to, again, thank Tegan so much for her time this evening. Thank you all for coming and learning a little bit with us. We really appreciate that. Um, James, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'm, I'll just remind everybody that uh, probably in a week or two, the um, talk will be available on the museum's uh, YouTube channel. We'll share that with Tegan to make sure that it gets disseminated to 
So those of you that were in attendance tonight can also share it with folks you know who couldn't join us. Um, and I'd also like to thank Tegan um, and Emma for connecting us up with Tegan. It's great to have been able to partner with the a like-minded institution that's uh, a little closer to the city than we are, um, especially when there there is a connection uh, between our two places. So it's it's been very much appreciated. Likewise. Perfect. All right. Um, I think that's everything. So thank you again for coming and have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.